Today on the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, we're going to give you an overview of the book of Zechariah. My name is Aaron Ventura, and I'm joined today by Pastor Doug Wilson. Pastor Doug, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Hi. So Zechariah is one of the latter prophets as opposed to the former prophets. Uh, Before we get into the actual text, can you set the context for us? What's happening in Israel's history at this time? Sure. This is um, the return from the exile uh, period. The, which would be um, the exile, the 70 years away is 586 to 539 BC. So right after that. Okay. okay? Um, and Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai. Re- if Zechariah is confusing to the modern reader in a mm-hmm. number of sections because of its apocalyptic nature. It's not all apocalyptic, but they're apocalyptic sections. And uh, you might be helped some by reading it together with Haggai. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's one thing. The, another uh, contextual um, uh, aspect to this is um, you should look to the New Testament to interpret um, portions of Ze- uh, Zechariah because there are multiple instances of that, which I think we'll get to later. Yeah. Uh, one of the references is – uh, Jesus mentions um, Zechariah, son of Berechiah, which is our Zechariah. Yeah. He's the son of Berechiah. That he was murdered be- between the, the uh, what the, between the temple and the altar. Yeah. Um, but in Second Chronicles twenty four, that happened to Zechariah, son of Jehoiada. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, my now some people think it's scribal error. You know, someone got muddled and and that sort of thing. But uh, we have to remember that. The history of Israel was tumultuous. Zechariah is a common name. And it's it would be like saying, well, there's a contradiction because I found two martyrs mm-hmm. in the history of the Christian church whose name were John. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, well, Zechariah is a common name. And, and I take uh, the Lord's statement at face value that Zechariah, son of Berechiah, was martyred in much the same way that yeah. the son of Jehoiada was. Yeah. Um, so that that's... Um, that's that, and it was part of the the rough and tumble time of the Israelites coming back from exile in Babylon, yeah. and so this is the rebuilding of the temple, um, the era of Ezra and Nehemiah, and so yeah. So, if if you've uh, been following along through some of these prophetic books, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, even Daniel, and, and now Zechariah, having the the timeline of Ezra and Nehemiah in your head really helps color the environment that is being prophesied. And there's there's some really encouraging sections here that directly connect to things that happen in, right. in the book of Nehemiah. So um, r- uh, go back and review those if you need to. Uh, can you outline how would you break up uh, these 14 chapters? Uh, I would break it into four, uh, four distinct uh, parts. The first is just sort of the preamble. It's, it's a very short preamble introduction, which would be the first six verses. Okay. So the first six verses of chapter one would be the preamble or the introduction. The the second section would be the series of night visions, Mm -hmm. okay, the series of night visions, and that uh, goes down to the end of chapter six. And then the teaching portion of the book Mm -hmm. would be chapter seven and eight. That's just straight didactic uh, teaching. And then the last section, which which Zechariah 9-1 through the end of the book mm-hmm. would be the um, the two great oracles. Yeah. Uh, so um, the where he's prophesying the coming of the shepherd king, mm-hmm. and the second one deals with the salvation of the entire world. Yeah. So um, those are the four basic parts: the preamble, the night visions, the teaching portion, and then topping it off or or crowning it with two great prophecies. Yeah. So when people open this up and they're starting to read about four horses and craftsmen and someone measuring stuff. We're in a whole nother world. And granted, it's a, it is a, a vision in the night and we've already encountered that. Uh, if you listen to the podcast on Daniel, there's <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff in, in right. there. And we saw that also in Ezekiel. Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. So I would say the same thing with this book is don't treat it like a crossword puzzle. Um, just let it happen to you. Yeah. Uh, just read Zechariah, read read it again, read it again. And over time, pieces are going to start to fall into place, yeah. particularly if you are reading the New Testament at the same time, because yeah. the New Testament is frequently going to tell you uh, what 
the, uh, passage is talking about. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why God speaks to us in these dark sayings or in visions and symbols? How much of it is uh, the cultural difference of, okay, we speak in English, we use emojis and GIFs and memes, which maybe <laughs> maybe they would have been like, these people are weird. Um, and how much of it, is, like God could have given us a more simple answer key where right. X equals Y or whatever, yeah. but, he, but he hasn't. He's made it hard. Right. Uh, like there's, this is work that we have to do. Yeah, well, not only that, but God, God does not just give us um, uh, bewildering sections like Daniel and Zechariah and Ezekiel and Revelation and portions of the Gospels because Jesus speaks this way also in, yeah. in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and so on. Uh, not only does he do this to us, but he calls it, uh, uh, the word apocalyptic means unveiling. So it's, or the, or the Latin is revelation, revelatio. Um, so um, he says, <laughs> here, let me make it clear. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so you have this vision of clarity where you see monsters in the sky. And, and, yeah. and you say, well, the, the, this, I thought this was supposed to be clarifying. Well, uh, yeah, it is, but God wants us to grow up. Um, don't be children in your in your understanding, and in, in your understanding, be men. And so the Bible, the Bible is a book that uh, I've, I'm 68 now, and I've been reading the Bible since I was a little kid. And there's stuff that's it's new. You know, there's always another layer. There's always uh, always room to grow, and that's not really not the case with other books. Yeah. You know, other books written by men, uninspired books, are the kind of books that you could get to the end of, mm -hmm. right? You could say, I'm not going to read that again. Yeah. <laughs> so there are portions of scripture where I come, and I still feel very much like a child. Yeah. Um, and, and that's because God wants me to stand up straight. He wants me to, you know, put on my big boy pants and, yeah. and work through it. Uh, now, I don't want to work through it where I'm twisting it out like a washcloth trying to understand every drop yeah. right now because it's a book for life, all of life. It's not a book for the next 10 minutes. Uh, but I would say this is part of God's call to maturity. Someone once said, you know, look, Christianity is a religion for grownups, mm -hmm. uh, childlike grownups who yeah. receive the, world, or the word like newborn babies, Peter says, yeah. desire the sincere, sincere milk of the word. But there's, there's room over your head. This is big sky country. There's a lot of space above. Yeah. One of the other things I wanted to do before we uh, – so we're going to be finishing up the, the year-long uh, or I guess the nine-month-long through the whole Bible reading challenge. And then in the summer, uh, typically we go through the New Testament. Before we get into the New Testament, I thought we should take some time to talk about this idea of the – the former days and the latter days or the last days, which if people have been reading through uh, the, this section of scripture, we're starting to, um, even it begins with him saying in verse four, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, and then implying this would be one of the latter prophets. So how do you understand the way, um, at least the prophets during this time are using that idea of former days and latter days, and then how should we understand it? Is it a different kind of last days or latter days in the New Testament, or is it the same thing? I think it's a, a different sort of thing. The latter prophets, the, the prophets in the latter days are the, uh, the end of the beginning. Mm -hmm. The former prophets are the beginning of the beginning, yeah. right? And the early church is the beginning of the end, right? right? And then the, uh, the saints who are alive right before the second coming are the end of the end. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the beginning, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end, yeah. right? And, and so the latter prophets, well, there's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, but there's, so there's a d uh, dead air space there. But I think that they are um, sort of on either side of the great manifestation of Christ, the, the hinge that all of history uh, turns on. So... The the pious Jew, um, you can see this in the New Testament before the resurrection. Martha, at the, right before the the resuscitation of Lazarus, Martha says, "Well, I know he's going to be raised at the last day." And and um, and Jesus rebukes the Sadducees for not knowing their Bibles 
because the Bible clearly teaches the resurrection of the dead. And all the all pious Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead at the end of history. Um, and what happened with the curveball that God threw was it's like he grabbed the end of history and pulled it and punched it up through the the middle of history. Um, so in Acts, the the Jewish leaders were upset upset that the apostles were preaching the resurrection of the dead through Jesus. So the the Lord Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the Bible describes as a first fruits or a down payment or like an earnest, where the fact that someone rose from the dead in the middle of history means that the end of history happened in the middle of history. Yeah. Right? And that end of history happening in the middle of history is the watershed in between the latter prophets of the Old Testament mm -hmm. and the early apostles of the new. Right. So the way that uh, having just gone through Daniel and so when Daniel in Daniel 2, he sees the vision of the four beasts and then, uh, uh, or sorry, of uh, uh, the gold head and the silver mm -hmm. body down onto okay. the kingdom coming. And he says, you know, this is what's going to be in the, the latter days. And so it seems like the way that the prophets tend to use it is this um, the exile is kind of the the hinge point for them between the prophets that come before and then the prophets after. And then it would be kind of like from the decree of Cyrus f up until AD 70, that whole chunk would be in the, the way the prophets uh, here talk about it as the latter days. And then when we get to the New Testament, we're in the, as you said, when they say last days, they're, they don't just mean from the time of Jesus to the end. They mean... It's been coming, but we're in the end of, right. of the end. And so, and so um, Malachi and uh, basically the end of the Old Testament era would be Nebuchadnezzar's toes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The New Testament would be the rock that's carved out without human hands and right. strikes the statue on the feet. Yeah. It's, a new, uh, it's a new order, a new heavens and a new earth. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that – and this helps make sense of the New Testament – is I think of it as a relay race, so um, like a baton exchange in a relay race. So the Judaic aeon runs and ends in 70 AD. The Christian aeon begins in 33, uh, you know, th 30, 30 AD, yeah. roughly, give or take. Uh, so the Christian aeon runner starts running in 30, and the Judaic aeon runner continues to run until 70, right. and there's a baton exchange. There's a time period where they're both running. Yeah. They're, they're both in the race. Uh, and then the cataclysmic judgment falls on the temple, and then it's the new Israel. It's the Christian era. Yeah, and that's going to be key, in, especially when we get to the latter part of this book, because uh, some people want to punt some of this stuff into the end of, end of the world, and that framework of former days, latter days would – in some ways, limit it to it has to be during the time of Christ up through uh, when he comes and destroys Jerusalem. Uh, okay, so I wanted to see how much help we can get out of these uh, opening sections. So you mentioned uh, there's times where there's a vision. Here in uh, chapter one, he asks, you know, what does this mean? He's given an interpretation, but it doesn't, it's not that helpful. It's kind of uh, talking about these four horses. And then he just says these are the four. Uh, these just run to and fro, and so you're still kind of like, okay, well, uh, what does that mean? And then in Revelation six, we're also going to have more horses show up. So, what exactly do these horses represent? I think there, I I think we're talking about uh, in Revelation. I think we get a clue from Revelation, basically the and our expression of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. So. The four horsemen of the apocalypse would be war and famine and just basically it's not good news. Yeah. <laughs> so it's judgment it's coming? Judgment. Okay. Judgment okay. Coming. Yeah. Uh, what about these uh, craftsmen at the end of chapter one? It says, uh, so he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah. So we know horns are kings from, from Daniel. Uh, so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen are, I don't know what, is it the same thing in the ESV? Um, four craftsmen. Four craftsmen, okay. Are coming to terrify them to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So that sounds like these are good guys, mm -hmm. but who, is there any kind of historical reference we can pin this to? 
Yeah. So um, this is one of those places where I would not want to stand on a chair uh, with with great dogmatism, okay. right? But craftsmen are builders. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I think that what what we're envisioning here is the building of the church. Okay. So, um, like in Revelation again, you've got people with their Stanley measuring tape, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so they're the, um, and and the New Jerusalem is being built, and Peter talks about us being living stones and. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think that this whole book is about judgment on the one hand of the old order mm-hmm. and the building of a new edifice, yeah. uh, a new Jerusalem, a new way of doing things. So that's how I would take the, the craftsmen as, as builders. Yeah. And that's a, common, that's a very common image in the New Testament where the foundation of the apostles and prophets is laid. Christ is the chief cornerstone. Mm-hmm. And then God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, and they're all engaged in the work of building this yeah. edifice, this temple. Yeah. And um, and then um, Paul in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 3, it's the same same thing. You can build on this foundation, which is Christ, which is, or you, and you can build with wood, hay, and stubble, or you can build with precious stones. Uh, so the the builders, the pastors, and teachers of the New Covenant era mm-hmm. – I would take as the uh, the craftsman who replace the thing that's under judgment. Okay, and that makes sense. With the chapter two, we have a, a measuring line, so more kind of building imagery. And then in verse five, uh, God says, "For I says the Lord will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst." And so, uh, would you take this as a reference to God's protecting Ezra and Nehemiah while they're building under opposition? And then it having a more fuller, uh, maybe fulfillment in the New Testament yes. church, where we can say we're surrounded. Yes, I would say. Um, I think that there would be, um, and this this is uh, the question of double fulfillment, yeah. or or whether there's a type antitype, whether prophecies have a type and an antitype. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. Um, God loves to repeat Himself. Yeah. And and does we have how many times do we have a death and resurrection theme in the Bible? Well, all the way through. Right. How many times is there an exile and return theme? Well, all the way through. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how many times is God a bulwark or a wall of fire? You know, so God, this uh, is evocative of Shekinah glory. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a great cloud that's a pillar pillar by day and a fire by night. Um, this is the kind of protection that God provided the Israelites in the wilderness. I think he provides Ezra, Nehemiah, and the people rebuilding Jerusalem, and he does so in a wonderful way. And then we can look back at that and expect God to be the same way to his people. Yeah, one of those just how much more right. arguments now that we've come in, into exactly. the fullness. Okay. Exactly. Um, in uh, chapter 3, there's this interesting section about – Joshua, the high priest, being accused by uh, Satan, the the accuser here, and Joshua has these filthy garments. And if you remember, Joshua is the or Jeshua is how he's it's spelled. I think in Ezra and Nehemiah, he's the high priest, and then he's given new uh, new clothes. Uh, what is the significance of this passage? I I take that as a as a figure of justification by faith, imp- imputation of righteousness. Uh, in your own right, in your own person, you're a sinner. Even a godly, righteous leader is a sinner. It needs to have the, uh, an alien righteousness imputed to him. Yeah. And um, and I also take Joshua and Zerubbabel as the priestly ruler and the civil ruler. Yeah. And both of them together are an, a type of the coming Christ who is going to embody both he's going to, he's going to fulfill both of those roles in one person. Yeah, so so let's just jump there right now. So t- in chapter six, we see. Uh, so this would have been really, I think, strange to the Jews to hear this. So uh, Zechariah uh, Zechari is commanded to crown the high priest, and there seems to be. God forbid a mixing of uh, church and state here. <laughs> uh, so that civil office and that priestly, the high priestly office are somehow being merged. And then there's this prophecy here in, in both three and six of the branch, the the branch. So talk about the significance of this. Uh, this is a real change in the administration of the Jewish nation. 
Yes. So um, the Lord Jesus, as I said, embodies both the, the role of Zerubbabel and Joshua, but not only that, he embodies the role of Zechariah. Yeah. So um, he, is the, he, um, he is the prophet, priest, and king. Mm-hmm. So the, the three great offices of the Old Testament are, you know, Elijah coming out of the wilderness to rebuke the king mm-hmm. and the, separated, the separate priestly office. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the priests were... Uh, godly, like Jehoiada, and uh, you know they were, and sometimes there were prophets in the court, like Isaiah, um, or or Jeremiah. But there were also schools of the prophets, the outsiders. Yeah. The, and so, uh, what Christ does as the as the integration point of all things, he integrates the offices of prophet, priest, and king. And I think that that's typified by the two, the civil and the priestly ruler there, and then Zechariah, the the prophet who's telling them ab- <laughs> about this. And so there's a fusion in the, in the coming branch, the, yeah. and that's how uh, Christ is referred to in the uh, in the book of Zechariah, this coming branch is going to be the fruitful one that uh, blesses Israel with all the fruit yeah. that prophets and priests and kings should bring. Yeah. So how would a passage like this um, help the Jews identify who the Ma- Messiah is? Because so if we're going back to Genesis, okay, we know it's going to be a son, <laughs> a born, born of a woman, and then we eventually know it's going to be from the tribe of Judah, and then it gets kind of whittled down. And th- but this is a pretty significant help, I think, to them with their you know messianic expectation, who this can be. Uh, so how would this change maybe the political environment of the first century, knowing that this prophecy was given? Mm-hmm. Well, so one of the things that you should um, – one stumbling block that it should remove – is that Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi. Yeah. So um, uh, the high priest here is a Levite. Yeah. But basically the one thing you can't do is uh, fuse these offices and make Judah into Levi. Yeah. It's not – Yeah, because that's the riddle. Here, that's the tension here that right. makes it kind of difficult if you're a Jew to figure out, okay, how, right. well, how can this be so? And the answer to that is in Genesis and Psalms, mm-hmm. which is Melchizedek. Yeah. All right, so um, – and, and that's how um, the, uh, the author of Hebrews addresses it where he says, well, uh, there's another kind of priesthood uh, that's antecedent to the priesthood of Levi yeah. and which is senior to it. Abraham, who is the father – the grandfather of Levi or the ancestor of Levi, paid tithes to Melchizedek, thus recognizing his superiority. So um, that's how the fusion is accomplished. So it's going to be a it's going to be a king of Judah. It's going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek, yeah. and it's going to be a prophet like Moses. Okay. Uh, going back to chapter three, so this this is actually one of the passages that uh, gets referenced sometimes when you get to Jude and uh, talking about there's this dispute over the body of Moses, and some would say the body of Moses kind of like body of Christ refers to the high priest who bears on his body the nation and is a symbolic representative Mm -hmm. here. So um, it seems like in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they're rebuilding the temple, but you don't have anything holy. You got to re-holify everything. And that that seems to be what's going on here. Can you talk about how the, uh, the symbol here of the high priest's righteousness affects the nation as a whole, and then how the now Christ, the righteous one, would affect his people as a whole. So you mentioned justification earlier, but could you tease that out a little bit more? Okay, let me let me read the first few verses here, and then and and uh, correct me if I'm not understanding your question. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And again, Revelation talks about the devil being the accuser of the brethren. He accuses them day and night before the throne. So you have this a very similar setup here. And so Joshua the high priest is a representative. A priest represents the people 
in the apparatus of sacrifice. He, yeah. he goes in representing them, and Satan, accusing him, is accusing the people, yeah. right? And the Lord said, so this is probably one of those places where the angel of the Lord and the Lord is being used interchangeably. So Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, uh, which is the phrase that's quoted in, well, um, it, <laughs> Quoted is not the way to say it. I think alluded to. There's a hat tip to it because in Jude, it's over Michael uh, disputing with Satan over the body of Moses. Yeah. So he's he's referring to some uh, – pseudo. well, I don't want to say pseudepigraphal. Uh, there, there's pseudepigraphal writings. Yeah. There's apocalyptic – there's a, a, apocryphal writings. And then there's just – Fruity, fruity stuff, <laughs> fruity stuff that's out there that's not part of the apocrypha, I like the Book of Enoch and yeah. you know things like that. Um, but uh, this is when he when he cites that dispute that um, dispute that's not recorded in the Bible mm-hmm. between Michael and Satan over the body of Moses. Um, I think it has to be. Um, this passage has to be in mind yeah. s- somehow, yeah. right? And helps, I think, helps inform mm-hmm. this. So, who would who would Michael be? Well, I'd say the angel of the yeah. the, the angel of the Lord, um, and Moses. Uh, Moses would just like Joshua, the high priest, is representing yeah. uh, the people. Moses would represent the people of God. So, yeah. s- Satan wants to accuse and possess mm-hmm. God's people or Moses, or Joshua, yeah. and uh, there's a divine rebuke delivered to him to stop the accusation yeah. in both instances. Would you take the baptism of Jesus, when, so he, when he says, this is, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness, do you think this is the kind of passage that he might have in mind, where you have here a prophet coming to uh, cleanse the priest? So back in uh, Leviticus 8 and 9, Moses sprinkles oil and blood on Aaron and his sons, and that's how they kind of ordain them. And then John, the last of the the former, uh, the last of the latter prophets up till Christ comes, and he's kind of sprinkling someone who doesn't actually need it. Right. Would you see a connection? Yeah, there? I th- yes, yes I th- you, and you have the same thing in Isaiah uh, when uh, coal is taken from the altar, and so there's. Um, as someone is being called to prophetic ministry, yeah. uh, they are being set apart. Yeah. Okay, now with Jesus, it's sort of a, an odd invert, inverted setting apart, mm-hmm. because here uh, in Hebrews it says that uh, the high priest must sacrifice first for himself and then for the sins of the people. Yeah. Right? Um, Jesus, when he submits to baptism by John, which sort of throws John in a state of consternation. Yeah. You should be baptizing me. What's this all about? Uh, Jesus is, from the very first part of his ministry, he's ordained to the ministry by identifying with his people as in their sins, mm-hmm. right? So um, Joshua identifies with the people in their sins because he is with them in their sins. Yeah. Um, and Moses is with the people in their sins. He's excluded from the promised land because um, because he himself was a sinner. Yeah. Jesus joins with the sinners without any antecedent reason why he should, yeah. other than love. Yeah, he's kind of like taking on their filthy rags by his baptism in a certain sense, right? right. He's having John, a, le- a lesser man, put in a certain sense the sins of Israel upon him in this kind of like symbolic way before he even goes to the cross. Yeah. Think, think of it this way. It says in verse 3, Now Joshua was standing before the angel, uh, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And I think we can say, without irreverence, mm-hmm. um, and put them on somebody else. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's like, remove his filthy garments, put... And, and take the clean garments of that somebody else, mm-hmm. put them on Joshua, yeah. and take the filthy garments and put them on another Joshua, which is the glory of double imputation. Yeah. So um, in 2 Corinthians 
5.20, it says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mm-hmm. So the one without sin was, was made sinful. Uh, he was never a sinner, but he became sinful. Yeah. You know, whatever. Uh, basically, Jesus was never guilty of anything individually, but he had all of the guilt of his people placed on him. Yeah. And then all of the righteousness that of his was placed on his people. So jo- Jesus is the New Testament version of the name Joshua. Yeah. So uh, that's another striking yeah. uh, thing here. So Joshua's filthy clothes are taken away and put on Joshua. Yeah. And Joshua's clean clothes are taken away and put on Joshua. Yeah, it's Jesus every, everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, moving into uh, chapters 7 and 8, there is this uh, section on uh, fasting, and you kind of summarize it as uh, uh, what it says in Isaiah 58. God's like, well, were you really fasting for me or were you, were you fasting for yourself? And so um, I thought we could use this maybe as a, a springboard to talk about fasting more, more generally. So they had uh, we, we find out in chapter 8, verse 18, that they had a fast on the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh, and the tenth. And, you, you know, if you look in maybe the notes, it'll give reference to the reasons why they had these different commemorations for destruction of the temple, the death of uh, Gedalia, and so forth. So God here, though, says he's going to turn those fasts into, into feast days. And so could you talk about how should Christians living under a new administration of, of the covenant of grace think about fasting? Yeah. Um, and that's that's a more complicated topic than it initially appears because Jesus does say when the bridegroom is, you know, uh, the disciples of John fast, yeah. but my disciples are, why aren't your disciples fasting? And Jesus says that, well, that's because the bridegroom is with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the bridegroom leaves, then they will fast, mm-hmm. right? And um, and so that clearly indicates that Jesus expected that after he left, that fasting would become a, a part of an ordinary Christian regimen. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in the Book of Acts, we see that it does, but it's not fasting for fasting's sake. Mm-hmm. It's uh, teleological. So. It's when, in the run-up to an ordination, let's say, or you're about to commission Paul and Barnabas to, to go on a missionary journey. So yeah. there's the, it's that sort of thing where it's directed at something. And, of course, there would be uh, things that would be comparable to what would happen in the Old Testament, which would be a, a great a calamity threatens, yeah. you know. And if, if the president were to call for a day of fasting and prayer— uh, that would be straight out of the Old Testament. That would be no no different. Right. But as a characteristic of New Covenant people, mm-hmm. where you look at where you look at the people and say, "Oh, they," uh, you know, like the Pharisee in the temple, I fast twice a week. Yeah. And I'd say, "No, no, that's I, I, this is one of the places I'd want to point to." Yeah. Um, no, in um, Isaiah. Let's see if I find it real quick. I, w- I want to say Isaiah 25, 6 on the mountain of the Lord. Uh, yeah, on the mountain of the Lord of hosts. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. Um uh, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. So that, I think, is a characteristic, jubilant note of New Covenant worship. Yeah. And I think Zechariah is doing the same thing. Uh, these fasts are going to become uh, seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. So I, I have a problem with... Uh, this is not to get into things that divide Christians or not get too far into it. But in the Old Testament, there was one mandatory fast, yeah. and that was Yom Kippur, yeah. a fast in the sense of the people were required to afflict their souls. Yeah. Uh, and that was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 
so one day out of the Jewish calendar was a day of fasting in a sort of a Lenten way. Yeah. Right. Um, a universal religious fast. Yeah, for everyone. a religious fast be- to think about your sin. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the and many people don't know that Advent in the run up to Christmas is a penitential season in in those. Uh, communions that observe penitential seasons, Lent, the run-up to Easter, and Advent, the run-up to Christmas, are penitential seasons of fasting and yeah. preparation and whatever. Um, and I think that it's odd that the the New Covenant, which is supposed to be the time of jubilant fulfillment of all the longing of the Old Testament era, and this fasting is turned transformed into feasting, uh, where we... Uh, the Old Testament saints were required to afflict their souls for one day, and we're doing it for a couple of months. Yeah. I, I, now, but I don't want to overreact and shy away from the propriety of fasting because Jesus clearly taught it, and the early apostles yeah. clearly clearly modeled it. Yeah, the I, th- I think it's in the Didache. I've been reading some of the early church stuff, and um, I think in the Didache it mentions that. Uh, don't feast uh, or don't fast on the same days that the Jews fast. They wanted to make this right. distinction, but it seemed like it's very normal for them to be fasting almost like on a weekly basis. But it also seemed like um, there was typically this thing attached to it that so you can give portions to the poor. So there's a enormous poverty and affliction because they're Christians, they're being persecuted. A lot of them are out of jobs. And so it's almost a logistical diaconate kind of fast where we're saying we're going to sacrifice our meals so that we can feed I'm going to give others. somebody else my piece of pie. Mm-hmm. And that seems more congruous with what he says throughout the prophets about seeking justice and and mercy rather than right. these external uh, fasts. Um, I wonder also if you could talk about in, um, I forget if it's in Hebrews where it says, Remember those in prison as as those with them. So we want to recognize the unity of the universal body, which in some places is being uh, is being martyred or they're being persecuted. Um, maybe in our little corner, uh, we don't have as much of that intensity. So yeah, so there's a sense in which. Uh, the whole body of Christ is in some places rejoicing and feasting, but other places like fasting and afflicted. How do we um, affirm the unity of of the whole church and then decide in our practice, do I need to fast for Christians across the country who are being persecuted? When would that be appropriate or should it only be when it's a, a national thing or a local uh, Idaho thing. How should we think about that? Yeah, um, the uh, it's really a pro- basically this is a problem that is created by uh, the rapidity of modern communications that we know what's <laughs> happening. We know, and, <laughs> yeah. and oftentimes have video footage. Yeah, where um, two hundred years ago, you could have a devastating earthquake in China. Yeah, that that. Um, occurred in a Christian region and uh, churches were demolished and, you know, a great cataclysm in the body. And we wouldn't find out about it for, yeah. for years, yeah. right, if we found out about it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you, you've got a, 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 a digital feed on your watch yeah. that tells you that this is happening and you might recognize the city. Oh, I've got a cousin. You know, I know somebody there or whatever. So uh, then uh, Richard Weaver, in his book, uh, Ideas Have Consequences, um, has a, a critique of, for at the time when he wrote that, was uh, television and radio, mm-hmm. where you're, the newscaster announces this devastating earthquake, thousands dead, and now this, a word from our sponsor, and, <laughs> and here's, how you, uh, here's how you can make your teeth whiter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, use this toothpaste and, and then the girls will be impressed by your smile. And then you go back to the earthquake or the war in the Middle East and yeah. stuff. And uh, Weaver's complaint, and I think there's something to it, is that we're being yanked around on the end of a rope. Mm-hmm. And we're just not built to function that way, yeah. right? Um, but community, uh, the, 
and I think there's – it's happening on a greater scale and on a – on a um, uh, with more speed. But in life in community is always going to be that way to a certain extent because you come to church – because you want, you're going to announce that your daughter has finally gotten engaged and she's, got, she's your last child and she's going to be married and well settled. And somebody else comes with a prayer request about the cancer diagnosis that they just got. Well, the Bible tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so it's, it seems that if you've got a group of over 100 people, you're going to, you're going to have – situations with really good news and really bad news landing on different parts of your um, community at, on the same day, yeah. right? And we're, supposed to weep, we're, and we're supposed to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, which means that we have to have a certain sort of emotional discipline and flexibility mm-hmm. uh, without forgetting what we just were talking about when we turn from one to the turn from one to the other. And I think, and to, I'm circling back around to your question, I think the best thing to do is to let the law dictate the rhythm of our life. Mm-hmm. So the, um, uh, so I'm supposed to worship the Lord every seven days, yeah. no matter what. And in Leviticus 23, it's a, um, it's a festival. Yeah. Right. You're like not allowed to come into the presence of the king with a Dour face, right. right? This is I've I've got the discipline of coming to rejoice before him, and the person who's had the hard affliction land on him is to be encouraged to do the same, mm-hmm. r- right? Uh, but in order to encourage him to come and rejoice, yes, your husband has cancer, but let's go worship the Lord. Yeah. In order to be invite a person compellingly to come along to with you to worship the Lord. Mm-hmm. In order to be have the credibility, or the, um, the in order to have the credibility to invite them to do that, you've got to be the kind of person who really felt with them, who was really truly sympathetic with them. Uh, yes, I'm grieving with you. I'm I'm grieving for you. We are our hearts are breaking together with yours. Come, let's worship the Lord, and and the infrastructure of worship, and the infrastructure of the Christian year, yeah. uh, I think, has a certain authority over us. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, you know, for example, just this last year, my sister died just before Christmas, the week before Christmas. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this is hard providence, of um, out of the blue, sudden, but Christmas is still there, yeah. right? It's, it's like a um, – and it's like a safety harness, you, you know, um, and you don't say, oh, I've had this personal thing happen to me, this awful thing happen to our, our family. Let's let's outlaw Christmas or let's erase the whole thing. Yeah. Everybody knows that that would be wrong, mm-hmm. right? You, the, no, you're, you're throwing away your – you're throwing away one of your great supports. Yeah. So maybe to just put it pointedly, should fasting be – something that every Christian does, and if so, like when and how would yeah. how should they do that? I do uh, yes, I do think that it's um, Jesus speaks of it as an ordinary sort of thing. And when he talks about it, he said he talks about it, my followers, the bridegrooms with them, yeah. they're not fasting now, but my followers will fast at some point. And I think so so yes, I, I think that, uh, uh, Christians, all Christians should know something of fasting, okay. right? I don't think that all of them are called to the same levels, you know. Um, so you've got certain athletes of fasting. The Lord Jesus, 40, 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. I don't think anybody is required to to do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, people like John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus and I don't, we don't know how long the fasting was prior to yeah. the ordinations and acts and and so on, um, but I do think that that's the sort of thing that would is good to do, okay. and um, and we've done that in our in our community. They're periodically uh, fasting over the abortion carnage, or the, you know, where you dedicate time to um, 
either full or partial fasts. And you don't, I, I would say that the leadership of the church ought not to mandate that every person has got to do it exactly this way. Yeah. I, or, that, you're sinning or, or you're sinning. But I think an invitation or a summons to a fast is a good thing. Getting into these final chapters of, of the book, uh, and, this, and this are, these are some of the most challenging ones in terms of trying to understand when and how exactly to nail the kind of timing of some of these fulfillments. But we also have a really rich um, section of quotations from uh, th- yeah. things that get quoted in the New Testament. I'll just read a couple of them. Yeah. So uh, Zechariah 12.10, uh, then they will look on me whom they pierced. That's quoted in John 19.37. Right. And then uh, Zechariah 13.7, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's quoted in uh, Matthew 26.31. Uh, and then uh, I forget where it is. Oh, 11 also has uh, the weighing out of 30 shekels of silver, that, that princely piece. So. So um, I'll let you have your pick of uh, which one of these or which ones you want to uh, talk about. Okay, so I, f- I forget if we talked about this in a previous episode, but um, let me take the 30 pieces of silver one. Okay, good. Um, because the, uh, Matthew uh, basically says, as, is, as it is said in the prophet Jeremiah, and then he quotes this passage from Zechariah. Yeah. <laughs> right? And you go, huh, what? What? <laughs> Um, was that was did Matthew make a mistake? Yeah. Um, and I think the first thing is that when you, um, it's really ironic that modern Christians who are reading through Zechariah perhaps for the first time and they, and they notice something like that, they say, "Well, I think Jesus made a mistake when he said Zechariah son of Berechiah." You know, look, it's Jesus. <laughs> he probably had the Old Testament memorized. Yeah. <laughs> he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote it. Um, and on this, uh, we, we, we jump to contradiction or we jump to mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Well, uh, I'm just reading Jeremiah uh, now. And uh, it's quite interesting that Jeremiah, uh, who's a, a very gloomy prophet, has this, this highlighted moment of optimism where he's prophesying that the Babylonians are going to take the city and everything. But there's going to be a return from exile, and Jeremiah is told to take some money and buy a a field. And so he buys a field from a relative, and they have the whole thing sealed and done up. And he's doing this as a a testimony to the fact that uh, there will be fields bought and sold by Jews. The market will come back. (laughs) the The market will come back. And so Jeremiah has this field a field being bought for silver yeah okay and then Zechariah specifies the 30 pieces of mm-hmm. silver yeah. and then I, I believe Matthew is referring to both okay okay and and one of their uh, one of their conventions was when you are citing an amalgam of two prophets mm-hmm. the credit goes to the senior prophet mm-hmm. the major prophet yeah. okay so uh, so Matthew has Jeremiah and Zechariah in mind, and uh, and the explicit quotations from Zechariah, yeah. but he has both of them in mind, and according to their convention, he cites Jeremiah, he credits Jeremiah, and to object to that and say, oh, see, this is an error, it'd be like someone, an, uh, a historian 500 years from now, looking up one of uh, one of our articles and, and say and saying, well, this is a contradiction. This guy's an idiot because I went through the, the, his entire library, and there's no book there called Ibid, yeah. <laughs> or, or there's no there's no book. Um, it's just not. Uh, well, what he's d- demonstrating is he doesn't understand our our conventions of citation, yeah. right? So in when we say uh, here's another convention of ours, Jesus said that. You have to be born again if you want to go to heaven. Now, Jesus said that. I don't have to put quotation marks there. But if I say Jesus said, comma, quotation mark, yeah. then that convention says everything after that needs to be verbatim yeah. until you get to the closing quotation mark. So that's how we signal um, this is verbatim, people. Mm-hmm. And then we say Jesus said that. That's how we signal this is a paraphrase, people. Yeah. So that uh, um, – so why do we get conventions like that and the ancients don't? Yeah. So uh, I think Matthew 
knew perfectly well that he was quoting Zechariah, um, but he was referring to Jeremiah at the same time and followed their convention of, of uh, getting, giving credit or citing the, the, um, uh, the senior prophet. So are you saying that the land that Jeremiah bought is the same land that um, – that Judas gets no, no, not the same, not the same plot of land, okay. but um, Jeremiah is saying land will be bought and sold in this place, okay. and then Judas proves that by yeah. by his money being used to buy land okay. in the, in this place. Good. Um, okay, I got to ask one more question because uh, chapter fourteen is a real doozy, and we've got uh, we've got the Mount of Olives being split in two. There's this large valley. There's this day where it's like bright, but it's neither day or night. Uh, we've got horses with bells on them that say holiness to the Lord. Got people melting. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good one, right? Kind of the walking dead and they just dissolve while they stand on their feet, which is um, like, that's a curse if I ever uh, read one. So what is this pointing to? And when or how are we supposed to understand the fulfillment of this uh, yeah, chapter? I, um, I don't take it as a literal fulfillment. I take it okay. as the same same kind of decreation language okay. that you find with the the moon turning blood red, the stars falling. Okay. I think it's I think it's uh, uh, and and what that what the the decreation language in those other settings refers to is the collapse of a civil order. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so um, my uh, it's halfway between a guess and a conviction, a surmise. Okay. <laughs> okay, I would the first place I would look is the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, and so let me see if I can uh, turn some of these symbols into possible historical realities, and you and you tell me if if it could possibly be. So you're getting warmer. You're <laughs> yeah. getting warmer. <laughs> <laughs> so it says. Uh, it, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. And the people are going to uh, run run out of it, fle- flee as on the day uh, of the earthquake. So would this be um, – so we know Jesus – gives the Olivet Discourse. He preaches the destruction of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you say um, it was, I, I'm trying to understand, the splitting of a mountain into two. Right. Um, we know the temple is a symbolic holy mountain. We know Jesus gave sermons on the mountain. Um, can you, you know, connect any other dots maybe yeah. with what we know about what happened in the first century yeah. and, and something like this? So Jesus is, um, says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, um, you will say to this mountain. Now, notice he doesn't say you will travel to the Rockies or you will go to the Alps. But he's saying he's talking about um, to his apostles yeah. and he's talking about them wielding the judgment of God. Yeah. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, yeah. be thrown into the sea, which is clearly, again, in Revelation, a huge rock is thrown into the sea. Uh, the, I think the image it, here is similar. And when when you have um, a mountain split in two, uh, that evokes to me the Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's bless, a good connection. Bless, blessing and cur- – uh, they were two separate mountains already, yeah. but they were – Blessings and curses. Yeah. I think that that's what's behind Ecclesiastes. The wise man's heart inclines to the right, the fool's heart to the left. Okay, okay you're, when you're coming into Palestine from the east, yeah. blessings to the right, curses to the, to the left. Okay. Um, and the, the Sermon on the Mount is – Man, that'll split the world in two. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that'll preach. That'll preach. <laughs> that'll, so that's okay. Here's the way of righteousness. Yeah. And here's don't be like the hypocrites who who follow the carnal path. Don't be like that. Yeah. That's that's one way. This is the other way. So and and then all of that culminates in the conflagration of 
the whole city being destroyed. Yeah. The, the, final, the final verse of, of the book, it says, In that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And just prior to that, you have kind of all these nations coming and this expansion of holiness. So it's not just the, the most holy place. It seems to be expanded to the point where all the pots in, in the houses in Jerusalem are going to be holy. And so the, all of those mosaic curses that uh, would happen to Israel if they broke covenant now seem to be kind of almost universally uh, applied. And then there's also this section about if you don't go up to the Feast of Tabernacles, God's not give, going to give rain to you. So would now like applying this, would this mean something like if you don't go to church, if you... Uh, if your nation doesn't worship Jesus, then these plagues are going to happen to you. Yes, I, I, I think that's fair. And also in, in chapter 14, verse 8, On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. Well, that's very Ezekiel-like. Yeah. All right, that's living water flowing out from across the threshold of the temple. Um, so this locates it for me as new, a new covenant uh, a new covenant reality and then the the last thing that you mentioned about the not being a Canaanite at the end of Isaiah God says I will take priests and Levites from among the Gentiles mm-hmm. so there's the universalization of the church in the new Israel okay. so um, so yes that's I don't think you're spiritualizing in a wrong-headed way when you say this is uh, all talking about the new Jerusalem, the new Christian church, the new order of things. Yes. Okay, very good. Well, that is the book of Zechariah. Sorry, we couldn't answer uh, every question you have from every chapter. We did that on purpose. <laughs> but that was the plan. Uh, up next, we got our last and final book, the book of Psalms. Until next time, keep on reading.